joining them on the stage. I would like to introduce them. They've just sat down kindly and stood up with, uh, with their participation. So on my um, far left, I have Nelson Switzer, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Nestle Waters North America. And then to my immediate left, Kevin Hagen, the Director of Corporate Responsibility at Iron Mountain. So what we're going to do is, um, I've, I've asked, got, asked them to prep for a few questions, so it's going to be a bit of a Q&A amongst ourselves. But um, as with all the other sessions, we want to make it as interactive as possible. So raise your hands throughout the discussion, if and when you have a question, and we'll get a microphone to you. But um, what we're looking to do is take it back to the the beginning, so the why, why they started to look at measuring the social impact or of, of their activities of the business, then try and bring some ideas to yourselves from the, um, the how they're, they're doing it, and then finally what they, they've learned or what they're learning about the, the businesses learning from this um, activity. So um, I asked them both to prep from one, you know, one question to both of them, and um, it, well, before that actually, I'm gonna, before I jump in, you, some people might not know your uh, companies in this room. Um, I find that hard to believe, but if they don't, you've, probably all got, uh, you've both got 90 seconds to share what your company does and maybe how you plug into it. And just a bit of caveat, 30 minutes, time goes quickly, so I'm going to be a bit strict with the, the timing on both of you. So, um, Kevin, if you want to kick off 90 seconds about yourself and uh, what your organisation does. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. So, um, does anyone ever heard of Iron Mountain? Oh, yay, thank you. You saw the boxes on your desk? And it makes you either an accountant who's loading up the boxes or a, an attorney who's getting them back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one's happy, one's... Uh, um, so Iron Mountain's a data document storage and asset storage company. We have 1,400 facilities in 50-something countries across the globe. We're an S&P 500 company, uh, about $4 billion in annual sales. So we're sort of in that middle range of organizations, I think. Um, our efforts... Um, so document data, cloud storage, uh, data centers more and more. So there's a kind of a, a continuum of technologies around how data is stored and manipulated and we're kind of following that curve. Um, I'll leave it there for starters. That, that was quick, Kevin. Terrific. You, you Great, so I get his extra 10 seconds. You get his extra seconds. 20 seconds, yeah, yeah. So good afternoon, my name is Nelson Switzer and uh, I work at uh, Nestle Waters North America. Uh, my role uh, within the company is to help make sure that we understand, uh, unwrap, and address the environmental and social uh, issues and impacts uh, of concern for us. Principally, we focus on uh, uh, three areas, uh, water, packaging, community, of course, energy, climate. Uh, these, uh, I would say, more traditional aspects around the sustainability journey for so many um, are also part of what we do, but really the three major buckets in which uh, uh, I continually, you know, cajole my team to work is, is water, packaging, and community, and that's quite aligned with, with what it is we do. Uh, I also play a role with the broader uh, team uh, with Nestle, both globally and, and here in the United States and Canada, uh, principally advising on uh, water and, uh, and governance issues as well. Really, my, my job is to help people make better decisions, uh, and uh, I've been doing it just over 20 years now. Uh, at Nestle Waters, we help deliver healthy hydration solutions. So that is uh, helping ensure that people have the option um, for uh, the uh, hydration solutions that they're after. Thank you. And I've realized I didn't introduce myself. I'm Liam Dowd, Managing Director at Ethical Corporation. And um, I don't need 90 seconds. I imagine a lot of you have had emails from me over the, over the years. Um, but we have a public publication out on the desk that gives us a bit of a broad overview of what we do. And obviously, you're all here at this event. So that's uh, some more inkling to what we do. Um, but our mission is to put, make, make sure pu businesses push and realize they have a key part in making a more responsible and sustainable world for us all. And um, that's what we're trying to get across the two days. And I thank you all for joining us um, to try and get ideas for your organizations. So uh, the question I, I asked of both of you to get uh, for around this session was, yeah, back to the beginning, the, the why. So what made you recognize the need to crack this uh, social impact code? You know, um, what made you realize it should be a, a, a critical or key focus for your business and obviously your work and your team's work. Um, over to you, Kevin. Um, and I'll set a time limit of a couple, couple of minutes to explain that bit. So uh, <laughs> no if you can wrap, wrap it up in that, yes. Yeah, no Oscars <laughs> kind of speech, yep. We identified six priority areas or materiality issues around our business over the last couple of years. Um, they are uh, data protection and safety, um, ethics and anti-corruption, employee safety, inclusion and diversity in our business, environmental footprint, and, our, and how do our products and services 
address environmental and social governance opportunities for our customers, or solve problems for our customers. So if those are our six topics, we got down to, wow, I'm, I was so proud of our greenhouse gas emissions reductions efforts, and it was kind of <coughs> lost in a sub-bullet of number five someplace on page two. Um, we suddenly realized that if we were, if we thought we were good on the metrics around driving behavior on our environmental footprint, we had to take a page out of that book and start figuring out how to use that same process to drive performance in the business on social metrics, on, on, on metrics that affect people. Let's just kind of cut through the jargon. Metrics that affect people and how our business affects people. Um, that started with internal audiences and, and really how does how, how do we drive safety culture around our employees or inclusion and diversity in employees and then, then it kind of carries on to how, what's our footprint and our impact in our communities. So that's sort of the setup of why we were why, why this is important to us. Um, I wish I could say that we were as far up the curve on understanding how to actually ex execute as we are on some of the environmental pieces. Um, but we know for a fact that when we cut through and figure out the right metrics, it puts an entirely different conversation in pl into play. Uh, with, um, you know, it, it, the whole topic sounds a little tree huggerish, a little uh, kinder, gentler kumbaya, <laughs> and uh, that's sort of the, we, we kind of get that reputation a little bit. When we can come into a business conversation with data and say, here's what we're talking about, and here's how it drives outcomes in our business for real business conversations, changes the entire tenor of the conversation and starts to allow us to put our business brains along with our sort of eco hearts to get whole person solutions to problems and they are much more effective. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were, I think, two important, um, I won't call them awakenings, but uh, certainly aha moments and uh, no pun intended on the principal sponsor of today. Uh, the first is sort of that positive side or the opportunity side, and the second is the, the negative implication of, of our operations. So on the positive, it, it became incredibly apparent to us when our mission was first defined to provide these healthy hydration solutions for people to displace carbonated soft drink. What an amazing opportunity it was. You know, we, are, we, we live in a civilization and in a society where people um, like to reach for a bottle of something. And so suddenly we had this opportunity to replace that bottle of sugar with a bottle of water. And when we thought about diabetes, heart disease, kidney failure, renal failure, I mean, you name it, the, the obesity issue that we have uh, around the world, uh, it was just such an, a massive opportunity to, to sort of see what could we displace. What is the social benefit that's derived from that? What's the economic value that comes from that as well? And it's enormous, and we've been calculating it over years. Trillions of calories, unnecessary calories from fructose and, and high, high corn starch syrups and so on, actually removed from diets. It's a tremendous, tremendous social benefit that's delivering. If, you think, if you're an insurance company, especially in the United States, uh, you're looking at companies like ours, and you are thanking your lucky stars because it's actually dropping health care premiums and costs. So... On the social benefit side, it's enormous, and that's just obviously scratching the surface. On the negative or on the challenge side, you know, we looked at it in terms of what is it that's allowing us, I, I call it our social license to grow. I know a lot of people talk about social license to operate, but we really are a growth enterprise, and so I, I talked about our social license to grow. And this notion is what is it that could potentially prevent us from growing as an organization? The package is one. The impact that, or the perceived impact of what it is that we do in a community. Um, I'm sure uh, uh, many of you are probably familiar with the, the issues that we are faced with or whether people think that uh, we're, we're over-exploiting a spring source, which is never the case, uh, or we are uh, dumping plastic, which of course is never the case. But, you know, these are perception issues and we have to recognize that. So whether there's a perception or a reality in this, um, we recognize that there is a social impact in both of those. So by, by breaking it down, we've looked at it two ways. Number one, what is the net social benefit that we provide or the net social detraction that we afford? Uh, and how are we going to reverse that course? So that's the work that we've done to both, I would say, get inspired to do the work, but also that put us on a critical path to make sure we're identifying the material aspects within our scope and a sphere of influence, and also those things just outside our sphere of influence that we can try to... Um, influence once again and so you obviously got the the head and the heart part 
yeah. as, as Kevin says, and identifying the right data, identifying the right data, the right metrics mm -hmm. is probably the, a stumbling block for many when they start on this quest. And mm -hmm. so, what what did, what process did you go through, um, and how did you identify, or is it just sheer, sheer through? Um, feeling what's right? Are these, you, know, you think going to areas where it feels right or was there a process involved, scientific process, academic process or business process? Is there anything you can share for those that are undergoing this or going back to stage, you know, phase two and looking for more data points? Can you share? Maybe, maybe go to you, Nelson. Um, so I you was going to suggest Kevin, but I'm happy to go first. <laughs> um, so I, I'd say when I, when I started in this space, and I won't speak, I'll get to Nestle Waters in a second, but when I, I would say really started in this space, Post consultants, so I started first uh, at a finance institution. They really didn't know what the hell was going on. You know, they they hired me uh, and said, "Hey, can you come in and run environmental risk for us?" Uh, and I looked at it as this huge opportunity to to take this to a very different place and truly em embed a, a series of metrics around sustainability uh, and understand net impact. And because of they didn't really understand what was going on, um, and they were at the time still throwing buckets of money at pretty much anything I suggested, which was incredible. I wish they'd do it now. Um, sending me to conferences and, and, and undertaking great projects. I got a great education, and what I learned was that um, the business never knows what they don't know, and you have to actually point it out to them. And the best way to do that is by showing them people who've already done it. Because what I have seen in many corporations is that many of them are first to be second. They look for somebody else who has already accomplished something and then they want you to do it as well. So um, that, that was a really important lesson that, that I took and I drive sort of not just a competitive spirit but it also sort of de-risks a lot of that. So I found that that was a really important piece. So I've been with Nestle Waters just under two years now and what we did to get more direct to your question, what we did was the first thing was to, to go around and, and look at uh, organizations that were similar to, the, to us and, and try to figure out what, what, what likenesses, you know, what could we liken from one to the other? And what was, uh, and then look at our operations and say, well, okay, then what's material to us? Just to get that internal buy-in to say there's something we need to do here, whether it's the opportunity or the risk that we need to, to manage in order to support our, our license to grow. But from that, uh, I took a very, very pragmatic, at least I believe it was pragmatic approach, which was starting at a very micro and local level looking at one facility, one factory, uh, in a community that sort of represented the gambit of our operations. So one factory, water bottling factory, that has a, an on-site spring, also has municipal supply, that, has, that produces its own uh, bottles, uh, bottles everything, manages logistics, and so really the, the full gambit. And from there, uh, we sat down and we mapped from top to bottom all of the social environmental and economic aspects that we could. Everything, whether we thought it was material or not. And went through and then did an exercise to determine three things. Number one, what is our capacity to move the needle on that metric? Number two, was it something that we could actually measure? And number three, was it relevant? Was this actually gonna be something that our operation cared about and our stakeholders cared about? So by scoring that and, and pulling it out, we have actually been able to identify, and I'm happy to get to it later, what those metrics actually are in this particular pilot case. Um, and and we're, we're actually looking to, to scale this up now uh, uh, year over year to see how much more refined we can get. Because our objective is to ensure that we have a net positive impact. I mean, we, we do live and breathe the principle of creating shared value, not necessarily the Porter definition, the real definition. Um, and, and so that's really where, where we're trying to go is what's the net impact that we are having and how are we, what are the levers we have to pull in order to shift it. Okay, thank you. And, and Kevin? I mean, what occurs to me to talk about it a little bit is um, some of the challenges around picking metrics. And many of you in the room are practitioners in the space and you know exactly what I'm talking about, but picking the wrong metrics can really get you the wrong answers. Mm -hmm. The, um, the negative unintended consequences of picking the wrong stuff can really be important. So I think there's a, a maturation process, sort of a, uh, a learning curve of going from sort of indicators to metrics to real goals and KPIs to really trying to drive continuous improvement and put weight on it. Uh, examples quick of trying to get, what do I mean by this? How do you get the wrong answers? In a previous life, we wanted to drive down waste. And so we put a metric around 
volume of waste at an individual um, distribution center location. All of a sudden, we started getting really good results. W volume of waste was going down like crazy across the business. It was amazing. It was awesome. One day, I took a tour and realized that uh, the informal network among the uh, distribution managers had realized that if you um, just buy a trash compactor, you can reduce the volume of waste <laughs> dramatically and meet your goals really easily. We hadn't changed anything, right? But we were getting those metrics. They were great, and everybody was getting <laughs> bonuses. They were, they were, things were going great. Um, brag about it in the report. So get the wrong metrics, get the wrong answers. So you have to be really cautious. I think the next part is really understand, uh, in our business anyway, maybe it's the same as others, our leadership team is very used to driving metrics really well. They, they're good at it. We are an operationally excellent organization. So essentially, so since this is not recorded, so they won't sign up to a goal I until they know. I think there's a camera at the end. So, so, we can chop it. So in a hypothetical company that I can imagine, <laughs> there are leaders who wouldn't sign up for a goal unless they already know how to game the numbers, right? And so, um, so figuring out the, uh, the two steps down the road of, so what are the consequences? How is this could be gamed? Squeeze the thing, it's gonna come out between your fingers someplace. So being smart enough to look down the road enough about how to set up the numbers so you get the, so you get the answers you really want is really a challenge. An example for us in the social metrics would be employee um, safety. Um, our, our safety team did a great job setting up uh, really good metrics for North American safety performance. Started to roll that out across to other countries and started to realize that the performance in other countries despite the walk through intuition of some of those facilities as not being as cautious, the numbers were amazing. There were no injuries in other countries. So we realized that's because people don't report them in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to develop a whole set of confidence and, um, and culture shift around reporting before we could put much pressure on the, the results because you get unintended consequences. So I think that there's two examples of kind of squeezing it in the wrong place, or strong, too soon for the wrong numbers, and getting bad answers. But I think we, um, so so far I have many more stories of bad results than good results. <laughs> You've noticed that, right? You were thinking to yourself, you're going, hey, so when do the good stories come? You know? So we, we have a, a few examples of things that I think we've, we've, we've started to drive well. I think my colleagues that work uh, specifically on inclusion and diversity have done a really good job around this. Um, instead of driving immediately on diversity numbers, we've, de we've tried to devise ways to understand better inclusiveness so that we can really try to figure out if we're hearing the people who are already here. Um, so that's a pretty important piece of the equation. An example would be, for example, instead of driving numbers around diversity hires or, uh, or changes in diversity in the, in the population, in our, in our employee population, we're really focusing a lot on looking at candidate slates and making sure that candidate slates are representative. Not put any pressure on anybody around what choices they make, but make sure the candidate slate is representative. And measuring performance of our recruiting organization and our leader and, our, and hiring managers to make sure they've got um, slates that look like the right slates. So I think that's one example of trying to get underneath the numbers far enough down to try to um, get the results we're looking for as we start to put pressure on those KPIs in order to get, in order to mitigate the opportunity for unintended consequences. Okay. Hey Liam, can I jump in for a second? Bump, bump in, yeah. Because uh, Kevin and I haven't met before, but I'm so glad that I'm learning from this actually. Uh, I'll, it reminds me, or it makes me think of that the, the notion of, of metrics uh, obviously being so key. One of the things, though, that I keep seeing is that people are, are talking about the same social metrics. Uh, you know, uh, like, it's like the same platform of social metrics. And they're, I think they're all relevant and important. Safety and inclusion, diversity, and, and, and so on. Uh, but I wanted to peel back just to what I was sharing a moment ago which is when we conducted that assessment, we're not really looking inside, we're looking outside. So what is the social impact of our operation? 
So there's a series of metrics that we have been working on around livelihood, community cohesion, the empowerment of an individual, uh, health, education. What is it that our operations are doing to actually move the needle on those particular issues? Because those are the pieces that move a community forward. Those are the, the, the elements that drive prosperity, health, and happiness. And really, that's what aligns directly with our mission. And was, was there particular departments within the organization that you worked with to You will be very surprised, I think, uh, finance. Uh, we worked with the finance mm -hmm. team. Because what we wanted to do was we wanted to figure out um, what is the uh, economic value that's generated as a result, right? Not, not necessarily for us, for the local community. So if suddenly you have, let's say you put up a new factory and you now have 100 new jobs in that community that they did not have before, and now you have a series of people who now have steady jobs that they didn't have before, who feel more confident, and that confidence actually compels them to send their children to a different school, to get a different type of education, which empowers them further to learn about how to take care of themselves better, and so on and so on. So quantifying the value that comes from that uh, was really quite an amazing thing. It, imagine an economic impact assessment on steroids, or on a good <laughs> bottle of water, perhaps. <laughs> I, it's funny you should say that. I would have been surprised maybe two months ago. We had our reporting event in London last month, mm -hmm. and we had CFOs talking about how they spearheaded the, so, the, the social impact measurements and the data that mm -hmm. they wanted to feed into the report. And it's the first time in all of the years that we've done this event that mm -hmm. the finance department were kind of spearheading. Um, yeah. so I'd love to say they spearheaded it, believe me. My team would have loved that too. <laughs> <laughs> they were intimately involved. Show, show up. Is show, yeah. 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 Show, showed show interest. Up. That's right. Um, I've got a few more questions, but I'm conscious we've got 25 minutes in and I haven't gone out to any of you uh, people out here, so I know everyone sat down, so I imagine there's going to be a raft of hands going up now for questions on how they can help or get some ideas on um, you know, identifying the data, um, what they're learning from it in, within their organizations, is there anyone else they've worked with, is there any questions? Yes, lady in the far corner, the microphone's just coming over to you. Oh, hold on one second. Here we are. There we are. Thank you, Liam. I'm Angela Kassler with the Sustainability Management Association. Are there some particular metrics that are highly motivating to your workforce rather than others? Um, I think the one that probably in every organization I've ever worked at, the one is uh, community involvement. From like when I'm just talking about employees alone, uh, the ones that really seem to, to motivate them is uh, how much time they can commit and the company has committed to the community, volunteerism. And the second one for us is uh, what's the, the, the change in health metrics that we, uh, our business has helped move. Because they, they feel that they are doing incredible work that is making the world a healthier place. So they love hearing about those numbers. How many trillions of calories did we take out this year? Okay, my, my answer is a little more snarky. And so, so, so take it with a grain of salt. Motivate my employees to do what? Um, motivate them to change their behavior, um, motivate them to feel great about the company, motivate them to stay employed with us. Or, um, so there's, there's, you know, motivated to do what is, is, is it, and it matters. The reason is I, I think that they are motivated, our employees tell us that they are motivated by volunteering their community, getting engaged, doing, and, and the support the company does for that. Um, I'm not sure that that differentiates us from anybody else or actually delivers us an advantage organizationally or helps us actually create more opportunity or benefit in our community. Um, I think other other metrics they're proud of, and and report that they're you know they have a lot of pride in the company as a result. Um, but I'm still working on that answer actually, and I, I, I it wasn't snarky to you. It's actually self-reflective. Is is that redundant? Redundant? Um, the, um, <laughs> um, the the. <laughs> The, the, the notion that, uh, that we're trying to, to, to figure out what, what, what is it that we're, what behavior are we trying to drive? Um, and then I can tell you uh, what metrics am I, am I good at, it can get us there. Okay. Uh, there's a lady just down here on the second table from the front. Can you talk a little bit about whether you have your um, data audited? 
we can that we just pick it up in the camera that uh, in the can you can you talk a little bit about whether you have the data audited or provide audited reports on the metrics that you have sure you want to go ahead why would I audit my data That you have a third party or, or an outside um, group that comes in and looks at the data that you've collected and you know kind of certifies mm -hmm. that the process is good, the measurement is good, so so get some in other checks on validity, that kind of stuff. So I suppose obviously when you're trying to prove the impact you're having. Um, yeah. So I ha we haven't really thought that our motivation is to prove to anybody else what's going on. Um, what our I, I think our primary motivation is to make sure our metrics are good so that we believe them, so that we will do more of them. So I think our, 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 first, our first priority is um, make sure that our metrics around corporate responsibility are as timely, as valid, and as reliable as our financial metrics. And I think that's our, sort of our internal standard of driving that because that's at, at that point, internal leaders believe them and will try to drive them and, and believe in making a difference in them. Um, so I think that our, so we are far from getting to the point where our first, our, our, our audience is external from a, from a, uh, do you believe me or not point of view. Even, <laughs> even an investor perspective. Oh, well, we're going to open a new can of worms. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, 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 half hour session. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you. Find me an investor who really actually uses the data to make a, a decision on what they invest in, and then we can talk. Uh, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll answer your question in two parts. Number one, so in our global CSV report, uh, yes, that data is audited. Most of the data I discussed today is not in that report as yet. Some of it is, but most of it isn't. Um, I am a recovering consultant. So I was at PwC <laughs> for five years, uh, where my team was responsible for these audits, and there's some value to it. I don't think that there's tremendous value to it. It's probably why it was so hard to sell that service to virtually every company I tried. Um, but there is some value to it for sure, and I found the greatest value on both sides, so as the, the auditor, but also as the auditee, uh, was that it sort of makes the team sit up a little bit straighter and double check their numbers. But I've also never seen anybody fail an audit. I haven't, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to sustainability uh, metrics and audits because they only pick a certain number, right? Because the, uh, the, I'll give you an example. The budget for the largest bank in Canada, their annual audit budget for their financials is $40 million. Ask me how much the sustainability audit budget is. <laughs> Go on, and I'll ask you. Fifty thousand mm. dollars. You can imagine how much depth you're actually going to get. So I do think it's important, and I do think it's something that can drive some more, uh, more value. But until we, um, and and I just mentioned this uh, yesterday on a panel with with David, uh, w until we get to a point where people value sustainability data, the way they value financial data, I don't think that it's uh, it's not where I would invest my time or money, because I, I could take that fifty thousand dollars and build another fantastic program. Yep. Just the way I felt. Thank and you. don't tell my former colleagues at PwC I said that. <laughs> mm. well, we'll cut that out of the video as well, don't worry. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. um, before we wrap up, is there any other burning question? We've obviously got lunch, but yes, to the gentleman there the, on the same table. Is the microphone still there? Hi, so just to kind of wrap that up, would you say that the data is mostly for internal use on, for, in both of your cases? So, uh, so I'll, I'll talk out of both sides of my mouth because I'm on the panel and I get to do that. <laughs> it makes it more interesting. I think transparency is our friend. All of this work is built on a cornerstone of transparency around the data. Because if we're not sharing it publicly, we're not being authentic about the data, then we're still playing hide the P around the table. So I think that the, all of our work is founded on good transparency and reporting. So that's so the data uh, is necessary for good transparency and good reporting. But I think the, so, so that's an external audience, obviously. But I think the, the real usage of the data, the real usage of numbers that we can use, is really about driving internal results. And in fact, my commitment to leadership team members is, if you collect data at my behest for a year and you don't use it to make a decision about, we will stop doing it. 
period. And I, I would, it's, it's very similar mm -hmm. for us as well. The intention is twofold. Number one, to drive decision making. Uh, and, and number two, to uh, provide that level of transparency that's relevant to our external stakeholders. Um, I want to wrap up on the, the what part. Um, so what have you learned? And that comes into how it's yeah, driving decision making. Can you share uh, a decision or um, what, something that you've learned from, from the, the, the social impacts that you've been measuring that you might not have seen if you didn't start on this quest? Um, and you both are looking at the, the kind of into space at the moment. So I, I have a good one, but, Go it's, for it. but, it's, more, but it's more on the on this environmental side. Um, although let's make sure we get someplace in the panel that we all mentioned that there's no such thing as environmental problems that aren't social problems. That's right. mm. And there's no such thing as social problems that don't have environmental consequences. Right? That's let's, right. Let's just make sure we get that into there here someplace before, before somebody assumes we didn't think that. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think uh, three, four years ago, um, starting to count carbon at Iron Mountain sounded pretty much like a liberal West Coast, what do you live in Seattle? Um, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, kind of comment in my company. What we found from the effort, though, was that it turned out that we understood a lot more about where our energy came from, why we needed better energy data, and the fact that we had dependencies on fossil fuels that were masked by the fact that we bought a lot of electricity. That dependency then actually led to the realization that we had tremendous volatility in our cost structure that we hadn't understood before. So as a result, carbon became a proxy for exposure to cost volatility that we hadn't understood before and we didn't have a really a metric around. All of a sudden, carbon counting got really interesting and it became a business driver to make decisions around, not just because we could be greener, but because we could drive out cost volatility in places that we didn't even know it existed previously. So I think that's a good example of going from sort of this uh, arm waving, if you will, <laughs> you know, a metric that didn't seem to be very business oriented. And very quickly, it's in the CFO's office and we're having good conversations about how this metric is driving business decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it, I think it's the most mature example because it's, you know, three or four years into that process at Iron Mountain. I, uh, I long for the day that I can start talking about some social metrics mm -hmm. in, the same, uh, in the same breath. Um, but I think that the, they're, they're on the way, they're coming. But I think that's the best example early on of being able to make the connection. And that example, by the way, is carrying a lot of water for me in terms of being able to be an example to our internal audiences to do the next thing. So I'll, I'll hit it with a, a social one. So uh, over the last number of years, we have recognized it's becoming more and more challenging to cite new spring sources. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric out there and there's a lot of, of uh, perception challenges that we face. Uh, and campaign groups, frankly, who uh, have been very, very effective. And as a result, uh, there are a number of communities that uh, initially invite us in to, because they'd like um, help developing their a spring source, uh, and, uh, and then we're, we're unable to do it. And so, you know, in, in recognizing that, one of the things that we did was we said, well, what is it that we don't understand? There's clearly something we don't understand. If the town manager and the mayor and the entire council is saying, please come here and build a factory and help us develop this spring source, why are we not able to move forward? So we recognize that we're not actually measuring the right thing. We were measuring a lagging indicator and not a leading indicator. So the leading indicator was actually the um, likelihood of success of siting in this particular location. And so we developed a process, we call it our preliminary community assessment process, uh, to measure the likelihood of success. This is a social metric. What is the community sentiment? What is necessary to move that if in fact you are going to develop? Now, uh, that was, uh, uh, I think, a big aha moment for the organization. Um, we have spent the last, uh, it's November, 13 months redeveloping a process that uh, is, is going to, I think, dramatically enhance our ability and our success. Because we now understand the community sentiment, we now understand likelihood of success much more acutely than we did prior. Anyways, I'm, I'm hoping that it will, will help us because, boy, it's been a lot of work. 13 months, yeah. And also a very exciting project. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. I also love the emphasis on lagging versus leading mm -hmm. indicators. You know, we get into that conversation with people because it really drives a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. that I think, you know, very frequently we think, you know, oh, it's got to be about financial metrics. 
and we find out, in fact, financial metrics are almost always lagging indicators. Mm -hmm. That doesn't turn it. That, that actually, when, you, when, when the business leaders actually get together, that's not what they talk about. They don't talk about sales in last quarter. They talk about, you know, if you're a retailer, they talk about driving traffic mm -hmm. in the next quarter mm -hmm. um, or other, uh, other metrics that are actually leading indicators which actually don't get measured in dollars. So actually our business leaders and business colleagues across the business are very comfortable with non-financial metrics. You just got to help them understand that that's what they do intuitively and what they understand best, and we're just applying a different area of it. I'm conscious we've gone over. Um, is it a quick question, Bill? Sure. Okay. Um, is that a microphone? Just shout out. You're at the front. I'm sure we can. Okay. Uh, basic question. So you mentioned this uh, preliminary community whatever mm -hmm. uh, process. Yeah. Would you want to share that publicly or have you? Uh, so Um, I don't think I'm prepared to do that yet because right now we're still refining the tool. But um, I'd be happy to sit down in the conversation if you'd like to discuss it. Okay. But our plan is at another event by some other organizer later this year <laughs> or early, early next year that we will be. Okay. Yeah. We're very excited. I mean, uh, the principle of transparency is very, very, as, as Kevin already noted, it's very important to us. We want to make sure that we are providing it. But um, Nestle, and, and I'll tell you myself, I like to make sure things are really buttoned down before putting it out there. Uh, so right now we're actually undergoing a process with an expert panel to do a review. Um, and I will be visiting two communities in which we have cited Springs uh, in the last number of years as well to test it with them to get their feedback. I'd like to make sure that it's gone through the ringer uh, of public discourse before releasing it. Thank you. I'm, I can hear it next door, and we've gone over by 10 minutes. I knew this was a session that could have gone on for an hour. Um, but it's an it's a interesting topic. It's a critical topic because, um, as we'd have heard, all day-to-day -day social impact is an area that everyone in this room is trying to address and trying to understand. And as you say, if you, could, don't, manage, uh, if you don't measure, you don't manage. So um, I'm sure there's going to be an orderly queue for you, Nelson, to have these one-on-one -on -one dis discussions with you in the coffee next. So um, can you please thank my two fellow panellists for their, for their insights in this session? Thank you. Thank you.